Howdy folks. How are we all doing? Teasing. I noticed my camera's a bit out of focus there. Let's put some light on this. Uh, what is this? That? Hope everyone's doing well on this Wednesday. Ooh. I'm a bit later than I anticipated. Um, I was on a telephone call before this. I'll tell you what, I do find that camera now slightly awkward. Bit higher than I would prefer it. Just this out a little. It's a bit better. Still not perfect though. Um, well, I've been having some fun making the changes that we talked about over the last few streams. We've also been making more of these. Seems to be getting through these. Pretty soon, they will have sold out of Black Ice MX boards, which is going to be a shame. And I can't get the bit to make anymore, so. There we go. Um, did I update this list? Yes, I did. Good. I was also back using the laptop for the last two days. I forget how damn noisy that laptop is when I go back to it. It's extraordinary. It's funny how used to things you get. Um, one of the things we're going to talk about today is um, some memory. And um, some changes around the way that the mezzanine is going to operate. Come to a bit of a realization, a slight change, which is good. Just clean my glasses whilst I've got an opportunity here. Well, I better let people know I'm streaming actually. That would be a good start, wouldn't it? let everyone know that uh, we're actually streaming. Always good. Uh, I had to do an update on the, uh, the workstation, which is why I'm slightly late with that and the telephone call. So that's why I'm a little bit behind. Let's if we could see through my uh, optical apparatus. All useful. Um, if anyone's out there, let me know how my audio is. 
levels that we've got here, but it's always good to check because you can't always tell just from the uh, audio meters to if there's something wrong. Look at that! Shiny! I can actually see through them. Wow, is that? The world is visible, or at least this part of it. Uh, let's put it to one side. Might have to update some of this documentation actually. Been a few days since I've done any of that. Just change this. Um, huh. That confused me for a second. The default window in this window that I just opened up was OBS. I had a bit of an infinite view. Uh, Spine Master Host. This one will take read me. Let's set that one up for the moment. Might need these in order to um, talk about the changes. Again, if anyone can check my audio, please let me know. Just make sure we're, um, we're good on the audio front. Before I continue, um, can I move this over, perhaps? It's definitely looking a bit soft. Annoying. What's really annoying about the way this camera mounted is mounted is there's like a clamp that clamps around it, but it gets in the way of the lens adjustments. So I get to a point where I can't actually turn the focus because. Um, course it is it gets in the way of this is really difficult getting this right and everything's backwards it's very confusing Laurie says the audio is fine. Good. Let's proceed then. So today, what do I want to talk about? Okay, well, I've had fun um, working out the uh, mezzanine. Um, just to remind you, let's just... Um, can I move this?
Oh, I know. I will use the power of the browser. Just to open this up. Uh, the default store OBS as well. <laughs> well uh, how? Okay, so if we look at these pictures, just to remind you what the mezzanine is. So here is the Ice Logic bench, as renamed, because we now talk about the deck as being the combination of the modules and the carrier. The carrier is the Ice Logic bench. Uh, here you've got the mezzanine connections, and then you've got a tile connection here. But this isn't just a regular tile that's been that's had different um, different powers since the very beginning and it doesn't have a cutout so you can't put all tiles there so I'm just messing with this at the moment my my thoughts are to extend the mezzanine from just this here so if we look down at this image you see there's two parts there's, this is actually reversed round, flipped round 180 degrees. You've got the mezzanine there and then the tile here. But what I'm suggesting moving forward is that becomes just one continuous mezzanine, um, which may or may not include tile-like functionality. And we'll come back to that at some point. Um, and that's what we're talking about changing now is what goes on here so one of the things I've been looking at is if we go back to here if you look closely you'll see we've got the uh, FPGA PGA here and then the mezzanine connectors and then the tile connector and then we've also got the microcontroller here and the USB connectors etc including the debug I'm going to be changing this a little um, along with the other changes so one of the things that the more and more I looked at the different cases for the different mezzanines I realized that I needed to provide the mezzanine with more capabilities to change. What does that mean? That means I have to give it more powers, which means it gets slightly more pins, effectively. And it gets much more control over those pins and what those pins connect to in terms of the, um, the ICE 40 FPGA and what it connects to without changing you know the tiles on either side those those remain the same um, but there are several different things going on um, the needs of the different mezzanines aimed at different things meant that I needed to provide more flexibility so my latest thinking is um, let me go back a bit so the thing the one the mezzanine I want to talk to really about today is the um, what we call the retro the retro deck now the retro deck is born of a few different things now one of the desires I had for a deck was for it to be um, educational because there is a you know a very 
obvious need out there to bring people up to speed on designing around FPGAs, learning how to use FPGAs to design things, including chips, but also design solutions for the FPGAs. Um, and the tools are now much more um, mature than they were when we started this. Um, but good, good ways of learning about that are actually fairly hard to come by in my experience. I mean, it, it always has been, frankly. Um, and there hasn't been any real big change. I mean, there's a bit more out there than there was before. So there's definitely an educational need out there. Now, the other need that we realized, and we've talked a lot about recently, is um, being able to leverage a lot of the retro, uh, retro HDL and work that the community out there has done, particularly I mean, originally it was ported onto, it was the Black Ice 2 that enabled this. An awful lot of work was done with that, and subsequently a lot more has been done, um, not just on Black Ice, but on other FPGA products as well. And it was clear to us that supporting that would be beneficial, because that in itself is very, <clears throat> interesting way to get into the FPGA market because um, it's fun um, and recreating old computer systems is um, not only fun and interesting but it's actually very educational if you want to see where things have come from it's a good idea to understand where they've been and what they were like and there's no better way of doing that than uh, breaking it down into its component parts in the FPGA uh, HTL. So it's it's also very educational as well as interesting and fun. <clears throat> One of the issues, being able to do that, you have somewhat different requirements from a modern compute system or modern computer system. What you really need is you don't need anything particularly fast in terms of memory, but the memory architecture itself needs to be fairly consistent with the way that the old retro systems work. Old retro systems had a simple mechanism. They had an address bus and they had a data bus and they had some control lines. Um, and mounted on there would be the peripherals, obviously, and would be the uh, random access memory, normally in the form of SRAM, and also there used to be a read-only memory, which is often things like EEPROM or PROM or whatever. Um, nowadays we tend to use flash for permanent read-only memory storage, and we often use DRAM and the likes for um, random access memory and the reason we use that is, is because it's um, power efficient, high capacity and it's economical because it's used so commonly. Um, so the trick is from an educational point of view um, the retro way of doing the memory and the read only and the RAM parts of that actually quite easy to get your head around unlike modern day counterparts having to deal with things like DRAM and constantly refreshing and the state machines that control that and the complexities of the high speed connections etc make it you know you put that in front of people and they kind of glaze over you know and you've, you've, you've lost your chance really of um, getting people into the FPGA stuff so um, one of the things I've been looking at is how we do the memory architecture <clears throat> um, for a retro deck, i.e. a solution of you know carrier board and, and tiles and mezzanine. And I think I may have found something now that I'm happy with, potentially. I've, I've still got to secure the parts, but I think I'll be able to do that. Now, 
<clears throat> what I'm looking at using is a combination of uh, flash for the read-only storage and PS RAM for the random access memory. Now PS RAM uh, can be had um, that provides an interface that's almost identical to what you would have had with SRAM. Um, even though underneath you've got low power DRAM doing it, but the refresh etc is hidden away from you and you work at a lower frequency so it's not an issue. You, you get good access time, similar to those you would have had in you know retro computers etc. But you don't get the issues, the latency issues that you get with regular um, DRAM type approaches. All the complexities of the state machines and the interfaces that tend to come with that. You also get a reasonable amount and that's again a nice thing to have for a whole number of reasons. Trouble is if you go down the SRAM route um, you tend to be very limited in size and it gets very expensive very quickly if you want a reasonable amount. So what I'm looking at is a combination of you know the PS RAM with a normal address bus and data bus and asynchronous read write controls you know output enable write enable chip selects uh, no waiting reasonable transfer rate you know for the retro type applications and here I'm thinking 16-bit type micros um, and also flash with similar interfaces i.e. with an address bus and a data bus rather than the SPI stuff because again once you start using the SPI things you, you make it much more complicated for people you, you, you've no longer got this kind of continuous interface that you that you're used to with the you know the um, the traditional way of doing it but I think I've found a solution to that that will give us plenty of flash access plenty of RAM access reasonable access times um, and therefore result in reasonable tick over speeds for any of the uh, uh, compute elements in here and that doesn't just go for being able to recreate the retro architectures, which we want to do, but it also goes for uh, a kind of soft core um, educational approach, i.e., building a soft core, uh, particularly if you want to build something like a 16 bit soft core. I mean, you could do 32 bit as well, but it's probably optimized for 16 bit type soft cores. So I think I now have the pieces that mean that we can do the educational route and the retro route in a deck design. And there's a lot of commonality between those things. Um, so that is the way subject to supply, which I am reasonably confident about at this point in time that I would like to take the uh, the solution not only that one of the other things we talked about was well could we get the microcontroller the STM32 doing some stuff over QSPY um, the answer is yes we could but I'm trying to avoid doing that where possible I think we should use um, the tiles to do this as much as possible and it's actually what we need is fairly simple so all we need now really is one more tile um, for the retro and the educational um, deck the retro deck which is a tile that has keyboard inputs audio out simple audio outputs and SD card um, the micro controller in this case is actually uh, very simple we don't need much from the micro what we what we need from it also needs to be shaped to fit with everything else I 
I wonder, can I do, I haven't installed, have I installed this, bear with me a sec. see if I can set something up whilst we're doing this. Um, whilst I continue the conversation. Um, please let me know your thoughts about what I've been talking about. And Laurie, please let me know your feedback. Um, I'm just going to download some because I'm, I want to be able to show, do a diagram or two. Um, see just trying to find the, um, the software I need to use my um, my drawing pad hold on I had it installed on the laptop, but I don't have it on here. You would think it would be on their website, like download, wouldn't you? Maybe I have to sign in. There we go. Manage. One device activated. Manage apps. Desktop app. Active. Download. Oh, mind you, I don't know if it works on here. Ha. <laughs> That's a good point. Oh, yeah, it might not work on um, Linux. Hold on. Where would it say? Yeah, I think this is Windows. This Give me an EXE, that's not very helpful. Hmm. I wonder if I can do this in the cloud. I'm sure it was like a Linux version. So a quick look at what this has downloaded. Yeah, that's a Win32 file. That's not going to help me. Ah, okay. Um, hmm. We shall have to stick to the uh, talk it through. I should have prepared this, shouldn't I? There you go. Laurie says it all sounds good to me. That's very agreeable, Laurie. <laughs> Should I try and think of something you won't like? Um, 
Yeah, I'm surprised. I thought there was a Linux version. Manage device and apps, integrations. Integrations. not helping. Right. I will look at that later. Okay, so here's the plan. Um, we will obviously need a simple way to copy files from the host into the flash memory. Yeah, let me just talk about the architecture first. So, the big change here from uh, the last few weeks is the mezzanine well, I want, the, I want the mezzanine to have more, more control. In order to do that, what I'm going to do is I'm going to move the microcontroller onto the mezzanine. Um, that does a bunch of stuff for me. So, for example, what it does is in the case of the retro, I will use a slightly different microcontroller that's more suitable. Now... What I'm going to have then, as far as the uh, FPGA is concerned, the ICE-40 in this case, what it will see is it will see an external address bus of um, I think, uh, I'm just trying to remember, I think 22 address lines from memory and uh, 16 bit data width and it's asynchronous and that will go to the PS RAM which just looks like SRAM basically it will go to the flash it will also go to the microcontroller a different one to the one we've been using strangely um, the reason it goes to the microcontroller as well is because I want to map certain functions in the microcontroller into this standard address map that we're using to keep things simple both from an educational point of view and from a retro point of view. So the microcontroller in this case will have an 8-bit interface from the FPGA but the FPGA in this case in the retro mezzanine case, i.e. the educational and retro type device, will be the master of that bus. And what it will be able to do is it will be able to address the uh, either the flash, the random access memory, or it will be able to access, address the microcontroller. But it won't see it as a microcontroller. What it will see is it will have access to the ADCs, for example. And it's an 8-bit asynchronous access so it's exactly the same as a memory interface except it's 8-bit rather than 16-bit that's the only difference god my laptop's just woken itself out that really annoys me when it does that
one, two. I do apologise, folks. I will have to re-say what I just said. Um, I think what I did was I knocked the camera. That disconnected the camera and reconnected it. And then the system automatically set, selected that as a audio input. Which is ironic because it doesn't really have a microphone attached. Anyhow, back to where we were. So, the FPGA has either a retro machine running in it or it has a soft core, you know, and we're going to talk about that in a bit um, for an educational point of view or a modern gaming uh, core, like a 16 bit core, for example. And there is an address bus, the address bus goes to the uh, random access memory along with the data bus and it goes to the flash along with the data bus and it's 16-bit data bus. It also goes to the microcontroller which has a parallel interface and that is an 8-bit parallel interface rather than a 16-bit parallel interface. That means that you can read the ADC from the microcontroller. Uh, that's useful. And there is another possible alternate function that enables you not just to read the ADC, but actually read uh, data from the micro itself. Um, so you've got a choice. You can either upload information that you want to write to Flash over the serial port, which is also connected via USB, or you can have uh, the uh, microcontroller read from its storage and then the FPGA can read that from the microcontroller in order to transfer it into its addressable flash. Hopefully that will answer your question, Laurie. So basically the access to the ADC and the data, which is on the microcontroller, is done via the uh, uh, address bus and data bus, albeit at 8 bit rather than 16 bit. If that helps explain it. So everything is done over the more traditional, straightforward address data bus. That makes it much easier. Did that answer your question, Laurie, by the way? I bet the camera's out of focus now, slightly. It actually doesn't look too bad. Uh, Laurie may be busy. So everything sits in the address map. That's the point. Why can't you have 16-bit data than microcontroller. Uh, the reason I can't do that, Laurie, is because some of the pins that I need prevent me from doing that. I did try. I mean, if I find a way of making it 16-bit, even better. But right now, it's 8-bit. Um, in particular, well, there's, there's, there's several things that share the same bus. I'm playing around with, uh, the configuration to find out the optimum way. I haven't found a way of providing 16 bit access yet. I won't rule it out entirely, but it is unlikely with what I've seen so far. It just happens to be the way that the pins are laid out. I need certain peripherals to interfere with a 16-bit, the use of a 16-bit port, and it has to be a 16-bit port in order for that to happen. Oh, tease out onto the water. Hello. 
how to get a file from the host. Well, the microcontroller has flash, so we can store stuff locally, and we can do that in a normal way. Um, we can write a simple bit of software that accepts um, DFU in the same way that we were operating before. Um, I think that's the easiest way of doing it, is just using DFU. So if we DFU into the microcontroller over USB, that writes it into flash, the microcontroller's flash. Then, um, when the image is programmed into the um, ICE 40, it can then go and query the microcontroller over the address bus and read the necessary um, data and transfer it to its own flash. Or you can do it over UART because the UART is connected between the FPGA and the micro. But when we do it over the UART, it's more complicated because we'd have to go into some sort of command mode or something. And yes, the detail obviously needs filling in. I just think the easiest way to do it is to make everything addressable in that address map. Uh, and the only bit we add to that is obviously the DFU support on the microcontroller itself so that it can, you know, take, take data from the host. Now, I do have one problem. Does that answer your question, Laurie? Because I do have a question for you. I need to understand something about uh, accessing um, on the retro front. Yeah, that answers your question. Good. So, on the retro front, remember when we were talking about um, accessing the uh, remember we were talking about like on-screen displays and accessing an SD card and we talked about building a tile but so the plan is build a tile that has on it an SD card and audio jack and you know like PS2 ports or whatever for keyboards on that SD card lorry because that's being accessed by the FPGA. How does that work in a retro situation? How does the FPGA read that in a retro situation? Do we have to format that in a very specific way or what? How does that normally work? Okay, so Laurie says for the BBC Micro and the Acorn Atom, special ROMs were developed that do the SD card access. So does that mean that in those cases it doesn't need the um, the microcontroller to be involved? And yes, they need a specific format. So that's those. And I'm assuming the microcontroller doesn't need to get involved in those, right? Those cases that you mentioned. 
other than obviously installing the FPGA image. Right, cool. Okay, so that's those cases, so I understand that, and the SD card solution works with that. Presumably, then there's a bunch of cases where that's not the case. So the question is, what do we do in those examples? What's our solution? Is it that they don't need SD card support or that we have to develop something similar so that they can read the SD card? I'm trying to avoid the... Um, the microcontroller involvement where possible. Some other cases do floppy em emulation. Okay, so this is basically making an SD card look like a floppy disk, right? Um, presumably, are, th are most of those cases where that's done externally? Way the micro is involved in that emulation or can it be done within the HDL itself uh, the Amstrad CPC does that I think the Apple II does that yeah well there is software for I mean both of those had floppy drives right so if you have an abstraction that can do the conversion somehow from the floppy to the SD card then we're kind of hunky-dory but does that conversion happen in HDL or you know how, how, how does that look likewise with a Mac obviously yeah, that had its own um, they had 400k and 800k drives didn't they So it's a case of making the SD card look a lot like a floppy. And can that be done in the HDL? Right, so in all the cases I've done it, it uses the microcontroller. Okay, so this is where we've got potentially an issue because that SD card that sits, you know, on this tile that's accessible by the FPGA isn't necessarily useful in this case. You kind of want the microcontroller to have it. So basically, you're asking the microcontroller to read the SD card, but pretend to be a floppy. And then there's some interface. I think you did show me one of the interfaces, but yeah. But I think it could be done in HDL. Um, is it troublesome in terms of buffers and things or? Doing SD card access in gateway is not very hard. Because you're presenting it as a block device, right? Yeah. Because I think we're going to need to do this rather than have it go through the microcontroller if this tile is to be the kind of universal solution. Okay, so this is something that we need to spend some time at um, understanding. 
Let me ask another question, Laurie. Is it best to have the ICE 40 talking to the SD card directly? Or should I add something on the tile to do this? Or does that just make it complicated and not very helpful? Directly, yeah. Good. I prefer direct. Okay, well, it's something we need to think of as part of this. Um, I was thinking of doing, um, just for fun, offering a floppy drive tile as well that can connect to a more modern floppy. Just for the fun of it. And that too could be a block device. So that you could actually use and insert floppies if you want to. Um, you can get very, you, these are quite easy to get. You can get like, um, you know, the laptop ones that connect over USB. But you can, if you look inside, there's just an FPC cable with a regular floppy port on it. You can get rid of the USB part of that. And connect the FPC directly to the um, tile or you can have a FPC slash IDC header on the tile so you can connect either to the the larger ones that have IDC connectors or you can connect via the um, FPC type you know the compact laptop type ones one issue with doing it in hardware is that you need a UI to select a floppy image it's because the SD card contains a number of those right yeah how do we do that I'm not sure how we do that it's not something I've had a lot of experience with um, I was thinking, can they be like partitions? But I don't know. Can you use the concept of partitions? Maybe, I don't, I don't know if that um, makes sense or not. But even then, you know, it needs to know, it needs to recognise which partition, right? Um, can the, could the name of the partition be burned in? Or I guess what you're saying, hmm. I mean, if you were running a Beeb, would you only need one partition? Oh, in fact, in that case, you don't need it because it can read the different partitions. But in the other cases, could you use the fixed name or identity? Or is the trick that you need multiple? Yeah, you need multiple images and you need one with just that one. Okay, well, we need to have a think about that. Um, I wonder if that could be done. Hmm. Yeah, the Beaver and the Atom have hundreds of images to select from. I 
I mean, the, even the Atom, it's not a problem if they have a UI. But there needs to be a UI, is what you're saying. Something that's capable of reading partitions. We need to solve that. <sighs> okay. Hmm. You can't use like a partition directory or anything, can you? But then again, it wouldn't know which ones are relevant. I mean, you could have some metadata on it, but what reads the metadata, I guess? Some simple hardware floppy emulators have an LCD and up and down buttons to select from a small number of images. Yeah, I see where you're coming from. That kind of thing's possible. Um, okay, one to think about then. That's a problem we need to solve. Any other issues that we need to deal with whilst we're on this front? Oh, my laptop's restarting itself. Joyous. There you go, that's Microsoft Windows for you. The Mr. Atari 800 port has an interesting solution to this. Mmm, tell more. Oh, damn it. Why does it have to restart? I had a whole bunch of stuff lined up on that. It's going to completely wreck that. <sighs> God. Silly Microsoft. Don't turn off your computer. Right. I had no intention. I didn't have any intention of restarting it. You just did that yourself, Windows. It uses a separate CPU called a ZPU to emulate the floppy drive. I'm not sure of the detail. That's not ZPU as in Mr. Gilquest's. Is it? Damn you, Windows. That's really messed with my stuff. Oh, look at that, this thing. Oh, it wants me to upgrade. No. Thank you very much. God! Bugger off Microsoft. Excuse me. Really want to Go back to bloody sleep. Stupid thing. Not even using the damn laptop. It's off on its own thing. Updated and restarted in the middle of a whole crap load of stuff that was open. So I've got to refind. Nice. Not sure of the detail. No, not zip CPU. A RISC V soft core with a UI is a possibility. It is, but it's additional resources, isn't it? Um, I mean, we need to do that anyhow, right? 
because I'm talking about this other core from a learning perspective. Um, but I wanted that core, I do want that core to be small. Um, I wonder if, um, I wonder if I post is here. Make yourself known. I post. Um, because this is definitely, uh, up his boulevard but what I what I want is yeah a, a risk five soft core that's part of the um, learning stuff oh I post is there let me just see He's on Discord. I'm not sure if he's watching this stream. Um, the games console is you select a cartridge rather than a floppy image. That is similar issues. Yeah. Uh, I post is just connecting. Um, so I post one of the things we're talking about is just a quick recap so I'm making some changes on the way that mezzanine is going to work it's going to have a wider um, responsibility more IOs and the retro deck will be aimed not only at people doing retro computer stuff but also about people learning soft cores um, one of the things we're talking about now is solving a problem on the retro side to do with reading the SD card but one of the things I thought this was relevant to you but one of the things I want is a, a core on there that's good educationally right um, and I figured you'd be quite good for this as well given that you did your um, A09 um, what I what I figure would be a good solution will, would be a 16 bit but a 16 bit risk 5 the reason for 16 bit is I want it to be small compact bijou but I also would like it to be risk 5 compatible so it would have to use a compressed instructions or whatever I mean you guys know more about risk 5 than I do um, so the question is, if you go down that route, um, how small would a 16-bit risk 5 be? Right, enough water for a bit. Remind me to hydrate. Um, I posted saying he's working on his RISC V RB32I implementation for his next series, um, but he, he's not uh, doing compressed. I've, he said he found a paper on it that helps in handling compressed, which is interesting. The RBE 32 bit RBE 32 I implementations are quite small. Uh, my post says I need either four digits or 32 LEDs. Well, I, I'm designing a four-digit um, seven-segment display tile, if that's any help to you, I post.
wasn't necessarily going to do one with 32 LEDs on it because I had another way of doing that. Uh, something that Laurie and I discussed the other day actually, a kind of register status display. Um, one that you could run locally on like um, the host, for example. Um, so the question is, yeah, Laurie's uh, reeling off some examples. There's the Pico RV32, yeah, the Femto RV32, and several others that are small. So here's a question then. If you go with the compressed instructions, um, can you make it smaller? And 16 bit like. Um, I posted saying he's talking about his um, RVI 32i. Um, he's saying it should fit on the logic deck. Sure, I know, I know it will fit on the logic deck. I'd be surprised if it doesn't. Um, but we're thinking even smaller than that, really. So it can coexist with some of this other stuff. Uh, Luke Renz Amaranth Hazard 2 is small. I've not even heard of that, Laurie. Is that a Risk 5? Hazard 2. Let me look that up. I'm getting all sorts of suggestions here. Is it called Hazard 2 Core or something? Have you got a link, Laurie? Thank you. As a two is a small two stage RV32 implementation written in MMIGEN. I like that it's written in MMIGEN as well. Um, mine is multi cycling single stage. Um, it's smaller than it's a smaller brother of the Hazard 5, a five stage. So this is two stage, obviously. Then RV32I MCZ CSR, which is due. I oh, was talking about the Hazard 5, plus lots of extra hard. Oh, no, 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 no. The processor is built around a single AHB light master port. AHV light is itself a fixed two stage pipeline, so it's natural fit. Um, those are to execute most of its instructions at one CPI, with the exception of branches. One cycle, none taken, two cycles taken, and load and store. That looks interesting. I wonder how big it is. So it has a to CPU instance, four kilobyte RAM with an AHB light interface. SPI flash execute in place. One kilobyte direct map memory cache for fast execution. Uh, memory mapped registers. Blah 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 blah. The whole thing fits on a HX1K. Yeah, well, that's pretty small then. I think the, um, doesn't the Femto do that as well? And also, uh, what was the other one you mentioned? Small one. Pico RV32. Well, Pico RV32, I think does, but I can't remember off the top of my head. Don't forget, we don't have to do anything funky here. 
you know, he's got things like SPI flash serial execute in place of it. We don't need any of that because we're using a traditional memory mapped interface with address bus and data bus. Everything's on on a regular, like a retro um, structure. So we don't need any of the fancy bits. Not that I know how, how much that takes. I mean, he talks about using an AHB light interface. Does that save us? Is that a low overhead? Or is that a higher overhead than say, I mean, do we even need uh, an AHB? Can we not use something more retro like in terms of address buses? <clears throat> That's interesting. Um, whole thing fits on hs1k compressed instructions make the instructions smaller but probably add more logic you mean decoding logic instruction decoding logic so in other words it's compact in terms of storage i mean having the instructions 16-bit fits nicely with the memory structure There's more gateway required for compressed. Um, it doesn't, does he say anything about compressed on his? <laughs> Ankle sock. The smallest sock you can wear in public. Oh, Luke is funny. <laughs> Has he been spending time with Olaf? Uh, the, this uses 1,271 logic cells. I've never used AHBL. I mean, obviously it's used in ARM a lot. See, we don't need the spy execute in place, we can do that directly. Flash cache. Ooh, we don't need that either, really. I mean, we could add a cache if you wanted to, but we don't really need it. Output registers, yeah, LED. If anything, ours would be slightly simpler. <clears throat> Yeah, I post if you can chase down the paper. Yeah, I mean, it, it's, it'd be nice if there was someone already using it. But yeah, maybe, maybe I'm pushing too hard by thinking about the compressed instructions. I don't know what the impact of that would be. But this this hazard too looks very interesting. Um, there's a lot to read here, but it is interesting. I bet there's a whole bunch of stuff out there that I don't know about. Where did I read about a uh, RISC 5 16 bit recently? Uh, somebody built one hardware to prove some new uh, non-silicon technology I think it was god where was it um, damn if I can remember to be honest I haven't seen it used you know, a kind of 16-bit RISC-5 or talked about much.
oh yeah it was it was iPost posting about it what was it iPost was it some non silicon um, implementation there was a 16 bit risk 5 made on some you know non silicon I think it was um, carbon nanotubes there you go I guess the reason that they chose the 16 bit was I think the memory part of it was very difficult for them so it had to be um, compact. Oh, my camera's going out of focus now. That's weird. Anyhow, so we need a RISC V solution. Maybe we can take the hazard to maybe strip it down a bit further I don't know how much we gain by doing that it just needs to be really simple for this architecture and I want it to be really easy to follow as well and I post will know about this having done his remarkably good a09 series soft core I think this is definitely worth looking at. Is there a bit missing off that picture or is that the total thing? I really wish GitHub had a better way of viewing images. Hmm. Uh, Laurie says to use it for floppy emulation we need a UI so either an LCD or OSG or VGA well it will have VGA or HDMI it won't necessarily have an LCD but it will certainly have either VGA or HDMI you need that for retro and the educational stuff So we kind of got that covered, I guess. Definitely need to look at this hazard too. Have you actually used this at all, Laurie, yourself? I wonder what it looks like. I mean, it's written in um, MMIGEN, which is really nice. Hold on. Ankle sock. Hello world, I'm <laughs> running on the ice stick. How funny. Let's have a look. Maybe I should download this and look at this. But hold on, let me just check this out. It's probably easier. Hazard two code. Copy. Let me just check this out and open it properly. Let's have a quick poke around, shall we?
Well, that downloaded quickly. That's always a good sign. Wonder if I can add it here. Have a quick look. Uh, See, I don't know if we'd need to use AHBL because we could, I wonder if we can just go more directly for an address bus. I don't know what having the AHBL gives us. Oh, uh, what's Laurie saying? So we could select a floppy of cartridge image using the OSD driven by the RISC V softcore. I didn't build and run that, um, but I did run Minerva. That was written in MMIGEN. I suspect that's bigger, more complex. Yeah, I suspect so. I mean, I don't know anything about AHB. BL, sorry, is it. Um, is it fairly efficient? I'm guessing it must be. Pardon me. Just have a quick look through here. There's a lot. A lot of this is dedicated to the AHBL. It'd be nice if there was one that didn't actually have the AHBL. So what is that? There's probably a whole bunch of stuff in here that we don't actually need. Let's have a look at, um, oh, generate hazard. Let's have a look at hazard. Oh, I post found that paper for the compressed instruction. Thanks, I post. I'll have a look at that offline. Uh, has a two shifter. I tell you. Add sub. Less than. Shift right and left, shift size to now. Okay, um, there's a two register file. Wow, this does look quite good. We should definitely have a play around with this. The hazard two CPU has the size of the address set by XLEN. Not sure how well that would work if we set that to sixteen. Hmm. T 
is interesting. Harbour address signal sixteen. Maybe we do thirty two, but then we have to deal with the uh, fact that it's only got a sixteen bit data bus. Um, it depends on if he literally relies on 32-bit instructions. I find most of the CPUs blend 32 and 16 together here. Yeah. And that's where this paper comes in here. Yeah. Um, Okay, well this is interesting. The hazard looks interesting. It's certainly something we can play with. But on one level it's slightly more complex than it needs to be. On another level we've still got this 32 16 bit issue potentially. Yeah, I need to dig into this a little deeper and understand it a bit better. You guys know more about this than me. I like that it's written in a Mygen. Oh, sorry. It is a Mygen. It'd be easy to port to Amaranth, I'm sure. Um, hmm. Hmm. Yeah, well, iPost is used to looking at Verilog or System Verilog. Um, not Amaranth. So, yeah, no surprise. But you can pr presumably recognise bits of it. Right. Hmm. I mean, I hadn't heard of Hazard 2, so that's interesting. I will take a look at that. I don't know if there are other possibilities. 16-bit um, compressed would be. I think better if we can get there. But I mean, it depends how much overhead that imposes on us. I guess is the answer. But anyhow, so that's the plan. Um,
may mean we have to do something more specific. Or Do we really want a cache? 32 bit to 16 bit. <clears throat> Just going to add complexity. Might speed it up now. Uh, I basically say normally I see 16 working in combination with 32 bit instructions. Yeah. I mean, there's some obvious candidates in the 32 area. It's whether we need to go to 16 or not. But you get my drift on what we need. And yes, if, if this can be made simple enough and small enough, um, then yes we can use that to do the OSD stuff as well I don't know how much room we have left over on these retro bits and bobs I really had my wish I would want eight digits <laughs> for the full 32 bit value but I could multiplex if I needed create my own tile uh, yeah you could do that um, you'd need to use um, somewhat smaller uh, seven segs to fit that many on we don't often see those kind of displays eight digits tend to jump up to something a bit uh, a bit more sophisticated like a small LCD or something Uh, what I posted saying is a minimum tile would be a few buttons and digits for CPU educational tile. Yeah, I concur. Definitely. Um, so that's that. Were, were there any questions on the changes to the mezzanine and in particular the uh, the retro educational mezzanine I know Lorient asked a lot of questions um, Yeah, I'm going to have a dig into this hazard. It looks nice. Hazard 2. Maybe we can come up with our own 
who likes doing that kind of stuff? Um, I've been following the chat over the last few days, but I may have missed something on the stream about the retro tile. Uh, yeah, the, the big change I post is I'm expanding what the mezzanine board does. So it always covers both the tile area and the mezzanine. Um, but I'm giving it a few more IOs to give it the flexibility that it needs. And one of the things I've been looking at is what I want to give it in order to support the retro functionality and the educational functionality is I want an address data bus, you know, a, a traditional async address data bus. So I need enough IOs for that. So I was going to put, um, so I was going to use a combination of PS RAM and flash that are memory mapped. So you have a, you know, a kind of 22 bit or whatever address bus. You have a 16 bit wide data bus. Um, and that gives you access to the, um, the PS RAM, which acts like S RAM. Uh, without the delays and stuff and access direct access to the flash and also gives you access to the ADC and potentially to storage inside the microcontroller because the microcontroller sits on that address bus on the async address bus although the microcontroller currently is limited to 8 bit rather than 16 bit So Laurie's asking, so the retro mezzanine now has an SCM32 and 16-bit PS RAM and flash. That's correct. Uh, there's a decoder on there um, for the chip selects, obviously. Um, And because the microcontroller is on the mezzanine now, so is the USB connection to the host. Also, there's some SPI flash connected to the microcontroller. Now, there won't be two iPost. The STM32 will live on the mezzanine, whether that's the retro mezzanine or the logic mezzanine or whatever we call the other one. There is a third one I'm working on as well, but I'm not going to say anything about that yet because you can't get the stuff for it. Yeah, having two uh, STM32s would be um, somewhat superfluous. And people would probably say overkill given the difficulty of getting hold of the damn things. Luckily I've already acquired what I need. Um, yeah, that, that's part of this change, removing it from the deck. And there's very good reason for it. So, Laurie asks a very good question here. Which STM32 are you considering for the retro mess? He already suspects that there's a change. So, on the retro, what we need the uh, STM32 to do is much simpler, considerably simpler. And as a result, uh, my current design is based around a much simpler STM32 for the mezzanine. For the other stuff, we still use, you know, a fancy one. But for the retro mezzanine, um, basically what I'm looking at using is an STM32 uh, Cortex uh, M0 in a 64 pin package, and I have them. And it has USB as well. Only a single USB as it turns out. Yes, I definitely have the MyPost. 
Oh, yeah, so uh, Laurie's saying, so we no longer have QSPY, but the 8-bit data instead. Uh, Ipo saying, don't get robbed. Well, I don't keep them here. I only keep enough to hand that I use. The rest have to go in special storage. Uh, low, um, you know, humidity and all that stuff. In a lot of cases, I don't actually see them because uh, they go straight to China to be manufactured or the PCB assembly house. Um, so yeah, Laurie, we don't have the Q spy on this because we don't need it. We have the more traditional addressing instead asynchronous you know address and data there is a UART that's the same and the USB access is a UART when it's not being used in DFU mode no the deck won't change shape I post it's exactly the same the tiles are the same and you know it's only the center bit that's changing the mezzanine board is one board that covers where the old center tile was and the um, mezzanine connectors it's just a jumbling around a kind of, not jumbling it's just a juggling of the IOs for the new scenario so that they're optimized you know the logic board itself you know the higher advanced higher performance advanced mezzanine will have the same sort of functionality it had before it's just where the components are have slight shifted slightly What control signals does the bus PS RAM have? Well, it has, uh, I forget how many address lines. Let's say there's 22, right? Uh, and then it has 16 data lines, has an output enable, write enable, and a chip select. Uh, obviously, you need chip select for, you know, the different, um, for, for the RAM and flash and for the microcontroller um, and there's a decoder that decodes that so there's two bits dedicated to up to four you know memory map devices it's very simple But that's the joy of it. That's the whole point. It's meant to be that simple. It's meant to be simple, like good for retro, but also good from an educational point point of view. Um, with the audio, I mean, I'm in two minds about what to do with the audio. So one of the tiles we were thinking of, my post was a tile that had an SD card, audio jack like a stereo audio jack and you know a keyboard connector on there of some sort like a PS2 or whatever so that could either be mono or it could be stereo but the other thing that we might do for example is um, yes we can do VGA but also if we can get the HDMI working we could have a HDMI tile uh, and alongside the HDMI tile, we could have an audio codec. So you then get your um, digital audio um, as well. But we haven't tried out, you know, a HDMI tile yet. That's quite high bandwidth stuff. Getting that working over tile 
is going to be an interesting exercise but I'm not going to count those chickens um, or those chicks until we can hatch them but the key thing here with the retro slash educational deck the retro deck is it simple from a development point of view we're not having to deal with the complexities of difficult memory interfaces or abstract conversions it just like you know the traditional way of doing it it's nice and simple and then people can focus in on what they need and it's also beneficial for any of the retro applications they can benefit from that as well A memory mapping everything in like that just makes it you know so much easier Sorry, so, so what's left on the um, ice logic board, uh, ice logic bench? Maybe we should just call it ice logic board. I say it enough. Other than the ice forty chips, uh, chip. Um, well, you've got all your power supply stuff. You've got all of your um, uh, in series resistors and things for the high speed memory interface you've got um, what have you got you've got all the tile support you've got all the connectors you've got you can kind of think of the ILB now as the distribution bit the interface bit the bus because another way of looking at this is The retro deck is really like you are building your own retro computer, one that can play retro stuff and be retro stuff, but could also be like a modern take on that retro computer. And you, you can add the modular pieces in to build your own retro deck. Um, USB-C for power delivery I was thinking about this I mean certainly for the advanced board we need that the question is is it useful for the retro deck given the peripherals that are going to go to make up that deck the tiles that we're going to use do we need to add in the um, USB power delivery? I can put it in. It's more than capable of doing that. The question is, is it actually useful? And what are the use cases? What do you think of that? I'm just going to do a refill. Bear with me a sec. Where's my mouse now?
I'm back. I've just worked out the trick with this cup. I didn't have the other valve open at the top, so when I drink for it, it comes out really bad. It kind of bubbles out. But having opened it, it comes out properly. I just need to make sure that stops me drinking too much air with it as well, which is good. Just need to make sure I don't drown myself now, tipping it down my face. Um, if you didn't have it, how would you power the ILB? Can you power it from the USB on the mess? Yeah, I mean, I on the existing prototype, I, I power it just from the regular USB. You don't have to power it from the power delivery slot. So, I mean, the, I can add in the power delivery stuff if we want, but I'm just wondering if it it serves any real purpose. I mean, it depends what you're going to do, what, what tiles you're going to um, put on. I was thinking, here, here's what I was thinking would come with the retro deck, right? A display a display tile, either VGA or HDMI. The SD card slash keyboard tile that may or may not have audio as well. Uh, a seven seg uh, tile and that's useful both from an educational point of view and from a debugging point of view, right? And then we've got a spare slot, and I'm not sure what goes in the spare slot at this point in time. I mean, at the moment. We could just provide a proto one so that you could build your own. But, you know, it could be anything. And you can replace any of those, right? But are you going to put something on there that needs the higher power? If you want that capability, then having the power delivery over USB is a good thing. And it's easy for me to add in. It's relatively low cost. In fact, at the moment, probably the most expensive thing is the damn USB connectors. But um, that's because they're a bit more difficult to get at the moment. But have you moved the regulator? Sorry, have you moved the regular USB to the MES? Uh, yeah, sorry, Laurie. Yeah, I thought I mentioned it earlier, but yeah, just to be clear, the regular USB now sits on the mezzanine connector. It's actually upside down, but it's USB C, so it doesn't actually matter. The question is do we add the power delivery onto the mezzanine as well? I wasn't going to put that I mean hmm. the other thing is we could have the power delivery uh, USB on the ILB if we wanted if we so wished So it sits on the mez and powers the whole deck. It can do, yes. The idea of the power delivery thing is it's optional. So we could put it on the, uh, we could make it none optional and put it on the, you know, the ice logic bench itself so that it was there in every case we could put it on the mez and it would take it down through you know what is currently the uh, um, the tile connector for want of a better word um, then it becomes optional whether you provide it with the mezzanine or not I'm trying to avoid putting things on the mezzanine that don't need to be there. There is, there is some minimalism here, potentially. 
Um, I'm kind of thinking having the power delivery is a good thing, right? Um, so the question is, where does it go? Do you put it on the uh, on the logic bench, or do you put it on the mezzanine? And 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 uh, regarding that, uh, there is. What did I just think of? So on the USB side. I'll have to come back around to that. I've lost my trail of thought. I mean, the question is, in the case of, I mean, I'm tempted to put power delivery either on the mes or the logic bench, but I'm not sure which. But I think including it is a good idea because it allows people to add peripherals in. But I'm just thinking, in the case of the retro, what would you use the power for? And by what I mean here is, what do you use the extra power delivery for, i.e. beyond five volts? What would you use that for in the retro type thing? And I guess the answer is, well, the retros Retro could be used to um, solve all sorts of things. You could put a stepper motor on it if you wanted, right? Um, I post says, could you have different meses for different requirements? Yes, definitely. There's already three that I'm aware of, two of which I've mentioned. Uh, the retro mes would have different power requirements. Motor mes would definitely need something different. Worst case would be uh, a real 3.5 inch loppy. Okay, right. So there is a good case, right? So when you're connecting the... Say you're using a laptop floppy. Does that require 12 volts? If it does, there's a good reason for having USB power delivery, right? But also, you know, yeah, you know, one of the there's other things I thought of. So, for example, you could you could do a soft AVR, and then you could run. Uh, Marlin or something on it, or Ger is it Gerbers, Gerbil, Gerbil? Um, just by adding the stepper controller. Um, so you run a, effectively an AVR in the FPGA. And then you could run the standard Gerbil code or Marlin code if you want. Or you could recompile it for the risk soft risk core. Um, but if you're going to do that, you can optimize it even further because you don't have to rely on the same interrupt structure for the steppers. Which is why I'm thinking it's a good idea to have the power delivery because if you want to add a motor control on there, that might be useful. And even from an educational point of view, it's useful. Even if you're building a simple robot, you know, not a, not something that does video and stuff, but some just basic robotic stuff. You could emulate turtles. <laughs> so 
So I, I guess we're already answering ourselves. Yeah, it might be nice to put a stepper driver on there. Yeah, it might be nice, you know, on the floppy tile to have 12 volts, right? Maybe there's other things that require something other than five volts. Oh, he's pinging me now. Oh, shopping. Oh, how are we doing for time? I haven't been checking. Sorry, excuse me, yawning. Uh, it's 20 to 10, so we've got another 20 minutes at least. So, how do people feel about the changes? Is this good? Is this bad? Am I barking up the wrong tree entirely? Am I a sandwich short of a picnic? Or does this make sense? When do you think you will have your new designs viewable? Uh, well, I was aiming to try and get it the um, ice logic bench done this week. The mezzanine probably will be finished by next week. I was just going to do the retro one first. I was going to put the other one off. Um, my thinking was probably ordering. Uh, um, A set of ice logic bench um, I wanted to talk about that as well damn it I forgot to copy the image over we could do this next time anyhow remember I said that there was going to be a premiere um, version uh, actually I'm gonna call it the tribute the tribute boards so the tribute decks now the tribute decks are the first version and they will be based around the retro fully upgradable to the other versions when I finish the other mezzanines basically and any other tiles that come with that but I just needed to tie something down so that we could put a deck together get them made get them out and I'll make a, you know, a small quantity of those available on a first come, first serve basis. Um, probably as a kit. So I'd probably have the uh, Ice Logic Bench, Retro Mezzanine, the uh, a seven segment tile of some sort, a VGA tile. Um, the SD card and keyboard slash audio tile and a proto tile at least so that so you'd have a full house and I'd get enough of those made for the tribute batch. Uh, folk knowledge it changed a lot from what we had a few weeks ago no not really I mean there's less on it um, I'm redoing some of the routing but yeah doesn't look that different there's the the one thing I'm considering strangely remember we had that conversation about having a cutout at the top uh, let me see if I can get this back up bear with me So on here, see we don't have the cutout for the top tile. I mean this, 
This may or may not be a tile moving forward. It may be something slightly different, but forget that detail for the moment. It's going to look very similar. But I may put a cutout in there. I've got a very good use case. So, yeah, before I go on to that, we'll, we'll cover that in a sec. We, we talk about MES 2, okay? So we've got the retro MES and then we've got the other MES that we historically called the logic, logic MES or whatever, but it's, we're probably gonna need another name for it. Um, but before I do that, so on here, can you see all the components? So a lot of these components aren't there anymore. There's just routing. You don't need the debug header on here anymore. That goes on the mezzanine. You don't need the regular USB. That goes on the mezzanine. So all of this stuff isn't there anymore. Um, the only one that might survive is the power delivery one, depending whether we decide to keep it on the uh, logic bench or put it on the mezzanine. So this looks a lot more empty now. It's also better from a routing point of view, believe you me, because it's gotten a bit messy with all the changes we've been making. So it gives me a clean start on this area to clean it up and optimize it slightly. Um, so what I'm thinking on the top here is having a cutaway like the others, potentially. The reason for it is not so it accepts a standard tile, because it's debatable whether that's going to be, because the mezzanines now cover that tile area as well. There will be peripherals on there, but how those peripherals work will vary. So one of the things I was considering for the mezzanine for the other mezzanine would be what I would coin uh, um, industrial mezzanine. I don't think we're going to call it that way, by the way. We're just I'm just naming it that temporarily to give the idea. So on the industrial mezzanine, what we'd have is what we originally envisaged we have the hyper ram hyper rom um we would have <laughs> robot arm <laughs> we'd have a um right i've lost my let me start again. hyper ram hyper rom we'd have possibly wi-fi let me come back to that in a second um we'd have the F7 STM32 that we had before. Basically, we have the same sort of functionality that we originally had. But on the back part of that, there's a bit that you can swap out. And that could either be like a double P mod, or it could be um, on the industrial mes. I see that as being something like it could, for example, have uh, a set of um, RJ45s, which is why I might want the, cut the cutout here. And those RJ45s could offer uh, Ethernet, CAN, and maybe RS485. Hence the industrial term. Space permitting, I can fit everything in. But you could have variations on the mezzanine. You could even have a POE mezzanine if you wanted. Although the cost goes up dramatically when you try and implement things like that.
Anyhow, that gives you an idea of the other mezzanine. Or other mezzanines. You could have options on the mezzanine. Like tiles. But forgive me, I need a bit of sugar. I hope this is making sense and not just sounding completely random. I really have thought about some of this, you know. I'm sure Western would like the uh, industrial one. Hi Weston. <laughs> I wasn't sure if you were there or not. Right, any questions on the mezzanine changes? More importantly, is everyone happy on the retro stuff? Because I need to get that done first and I need to, need to get the boards made this month. Are we okay with the uh, memory architecture, etc.? I think this way we've ticked all of the boxes and perhaps more. I've ticked, you know, some of the things I've wanted to do for a while as well on the in the educational space. <clears throat> and we have to look a bit more deeply at the um the risk five soft core and whether a compressed um sixteen bit is feasible for the soft core. Certainly going to poke around have a look at that hazard. Hazard 2. That's interesting. Uh, Laurie says, um, we have never used that type of RAM and flash so we can't be sure that everything will work. We'll have to try some retro ports. Yeah, we're going to have quite a bit of porting to do. Can you foresee any issues, Laurie? I mean, I foresee the work, obviously, but I mean, can you foresee issues with that? Uh, basically, the PS RAM is. Um, hmm. God, I can't remember now. 70 nanosecond. And the. Uh, I think the flash was 90 nanoseconds. But those are 16 bit as well. Don't forget. Atom and Bieber probably the best first. Yeah. They're certainly more comprehensive. They more directly support the SD card as well. Uh, 
Uh, as far as I know, it is constant, Laurie. Laurie's asking, as long as it's constant at 70 or 90, should be okay. As far as I know, it is constant. There are no weight signals or anything like that. And all the ref refresh is handled internally, so... The only ones it'd be an issue for is ones that need faster access than that. But I think most of them won't need anything faster, not on the retro front. Yeah, I think all of the Mac ones are up to, what is it, the LC? The last um, two. I think, is the SE 32-bit or 16-bit? I know the SE 30 was 32-bit Motorola. I can't remember what the SE was, but certainly all the Mac Plus is probably the LC or the Classic. I can't remember when they switched over to the 32-bit um, version. And the QL, yeah. I don't know much about the QL, to be honest. But. I'm surprised you haven't brought up keyboard. We need to mention that. I've got a crazy idea for keyboards. And yeah, there's plenty of memory, so any of the 16-bit stuff should fit. Finding the right keyboards right now is difficult. Finding like a USB keyboard that supports PS2 is tricky, as you know. I mean, you, you, you have found them. Um, Laurie, but these are an issue. Um, I was thinking of probably using PS2 sockets as well, but we might be able to use a USB uh, A or a USB C even. But um, Oh, so Laurie's saying it's more where whether the logic will fit. You mean in terms of the quantity of logic? Some PS2 keyboards don't work at 3 volt for 8. We could have level shifters. That's not an issue. We've got 5 volt on the tiles. Doing the level shifting is really easy. We just use a couple of FETs. Two or three FETs. Um... The other thing that I want to offer is basically keyboards. Um, and I want to um, have at least one keyboard design that you can build yourself. And one of the things that that will do is it will probably support USB, but it will also support PS2 modes so that you can use either. And I will make that available as well. And it will be self-assembly keyboard. You have to solder it yourself. Or get someone to solder it for you. But these are um, 
Well, you can make them any size you want. I mean, the kind of keyboards I like. Oh, I don't have the link here. Uh, I don't know if you can see. This is the kind of keyboard I like using. This is a keyboard I own. I like column of keyboards. It's upside down, by the way. It's that way around. Um, but I was going to make a, a kind of lighter weight version of that. Uh, which has um, those kind of uh, truck keys, the uh, lower level ones. But we can talk about that. Uh, there are all sorts of choices you can make. In fact, what probably one of the most expensive parts of it is actually buying the bloody keys and the caps that go on them. But there's, honestly, that whole keyboard thing is massive right now you there's, there's so many different uh, choices you can make as far as the keyboard switches and the caps etc all the layouts um, but that that's definitely another uh, that's like another sub project but I'd like to make one available and the key thing for me is not only would it support USB but it would support PS2 modes as well Yeah, they will be mechanical keys. Can't be doing with non-mechanical keys. And they'd be decent keys. Uh, and it will be based probably on an STM32. Um, but there's plenty of... Um, well-written keyboard code out there. In fact, there's some, there's actually some Rust um, keyboard code as well. The only thing that we probably add is the PS2 support, which is dead simple. But yeah, having PS2 support is really useful in these sorts of scenarios. So you've got a keyboard that you can hook up to your deck, because I know it, how difficult it can be to even find an old PS2 keyboard if you've got one. I mean, I've got some upstairs, but, um, or finding a USB that has a PS2 mode as well, because we don't want USB host, certainly in the retro stuff, because that just complicates things unreasonably. So PS2 is the answer. So just making sure that you've got a keyboard available that will, you know, support PS2 as well. Uh, the other thing that you can add into these keyboards is um, rotary encoders, which are kind of fun. Uh, you can even put OLEDs on them as well if you really want. Although, for me, that's not important. What some of them like to do is put RGB LEDs under the key so they use tr transparent caps and stuff. Again, I'm not really bothered about all that. But some folks like it. So you can build that capability in if you want. It's just more soldering, in my opinion. <clears throat> Although you can do part of it. Uh, surface mount. Trouble is all of the key um, stuff has to be um, through hole soldering. They're not surface mount devices generally speaking. Which is why it's a kind of DIY keyboard. You need to solder it yourself. Or have a friend that will do it for you if you so wish. Anyhow People are really into building keyboards right now. There are endless choices. Just just do a search, you'll see exactly what I'm talking about. Although very few of them have PS2 mode that I'm aware of, um, which is something that we'd like, obviously. Um, Ipo says, uh, is, is this something like what Ersden was doing? No, what Esden was doing was he was taking one of these. I'm not going to lift it up again because I keep pulling the cable up. The keyboard I.O. He was getting the parts directly from. I'm trying to remember who it is that makes them. It's not Rachel. I can't remember. And he was putting an FPGA in there instead of a microcontroller. Now, although that sounds like fun and would be good, I think it's slightly overkill and it just increases the cost 
where it's just using an STM32, particularly when I've got enough to cover me on this front. That seems like the sensible way of doing it to me. Um, that's that. Uh, Laurie's asked another question as well. Um, I helped my grandson make keyboards. He did the soldering. Cool. I mean, you know how easy it is. It's not difficult soldering, as long as it's designed well. Uh, how much is such a keyboard likely to cost? That I'm not really sure about. They're not particularly cheap. As I say, um, the big problem is it's the keys. If you want decent mechanical keys, those those are the expensive bits because you need like 50 keys or whatever. How many do I have on here? One, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, five, 20, 40, uh, 42, 44. You need somewhere between 40 and 50 keys, depending how much you like columnar keyboards or not, depending how many rows you want. If you want a separate numerical row, then you need nearer 50. Um, but yeah, you're looking about by 50 switches and the keycaps that go on. The keycaps aren't very expensive, but the 50 switches, good mechanical switches are more expensive. Then you need a PCB. Probably the best way to buy it is split so that you can move them and then it's better for your wrist. So you've got two bits, two PCBs that are kind of mirror up, mirror images of each other. I tend to prefer an ergonomic layout rather than just a flat straight one. Um, that's my preference, but yeah. Uh, and then it's programmable. So you can program the keys to do all sorts. And if you're doing columnar keyboards, which is what I use, then being able to program them is really, really handy. And having the thumb keys and stuff just makes it easier from a typing perspective. Um, but yeah, I don't know. These people spend literally hundreds, hundreds of pounds on some keyboards. But I'm looking at um doing it much lower cost uh the boards aren't expensive to get made i can get the boards made it's the keys that are probably costly the microcontrollers i've got the rest of the components are relatively low cost i'm assuming none led types here Oh, yeah. It'd be nice if it was like, I don't know. What would you pay for a decent keyboard? Now, don't forget, the other thing is with this, because it's USB as well, you can use it as your normal keyboard. So it can be, you know, a better keyboard than you might already have. You don't just need to use it for the deck. Um... You can use it for, you know, on your PC, etc. If you so wish. And in fact, if you made it cleverly, you could have two cables. So you could have one cable that goes to your computer and then another cable that goes to the deck and then have a switch on the keyboard. So you can switch between operating your computer and operating the deck, for example. How are we doing for time? Any more questions? Otherwise, I'm probably going to call it for this stream. So I've still got a few other bits to do this evening and I'm getting pretty naked, so. I think everyone so far here is positive about the changes. Don't be afraid to tell me if you uh, are negative about any of this. I can take it. 
honest. I clearly can. Any more from you, Laurie? Weston, have you got any computers? I don't, um, questions. I don't know how much you've been following along. Uh, I don't know if you was there from early on when we covered the retro stuff. But if there's new more questions, I will probably call it an evening because it is evening here. I know for some of you it might not be. Okay, guys, well, uh, I mean, I'll be down on Discord anyhow, so we can continue these conversations. We need to think a name for the other mezzanine. Sorry, the other deck. This one's obviously the retro deck. Uh, if someone thinks of a better name than the retro deck as well, please let me know. But then we have to also start thinking of names for the other one. Although that's less imminent, because I'm going to get the retro stuff done first. Um, the good thing about doing that and getting those out there is people, you know, can start playing with it. Um, there's going to be quite a bit of work porting, and I know. Laurie, you'll probably work on lots of porting stuff from the, your existing stuff that you've done, plus the stuff we've already got from Black Ice, too. Um, and on the, uh, you know, the Risk Five stuff, I know I post. Probably want to have uh, some input into that, as well as uh, Laurie. Um, yeah that's where we are right so <clears throat> do join me down on discord and or join us and um i might do a stream on friday we'll see still got quite a bit to get through this week we will see but this week has been a bit better than i expected to be to be quite honest i was expecting it to be a bit of a disaster luckily things took a better turn Okay, um, I will probably encode this one and upload it as well, which I didn't do with the other one. That was a very short one last week on Friday. I can see iPost is typing. Can I finish iPost? Ah, he's just hanging around and he's working on his uh, oh on the next uh, video series for his RV32 Q. Right, folks, thank you for sharing this with me. And uh, we'll continue the conversation down on Discord uh, and maybe do some more streaming on Friday. Ciao.